When hostilities commenced in Europe in 1939, it was realized that the American people had no intention of entering the war. But they believed that this country could be enticed into the war in very much the same way that it was enticed into the last one. They planned, first, to prepare the United States for foreign war under the guise of American defense. Second, to involve us in the war step by step without our realization. Third, to create a series of incidents which would force us into the actual conflict. These plans were, of course, to be covered and assisted by the full power of their propaganda. Our theaters soon became filled with plays portraying the glory of war. Newsreels lost all semblance of objectivity. And they have used the war to justify the restriction of congressional power and the assumption of dictatorial procedures on the part of the president and his appointees. A fear campaign was inaugurated. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. The American Revolutionary War began as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. Though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as the prime cause. That King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing and using for themselves. In turn, forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England at interest, immediately putting the colonies into debt. And, as Benjamin Franklin later wrote, The refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, greed-filled men associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that produces the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, two specific powers are inherent in central banking practice. The control of interest rates and the control of the money supply or inflation. The central bank does not simply supply a government's economy with money, it loans it to them at interest. Then through the use of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the entire structure of this system can only produce one thing in the long run. Debt. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For every single dollar produced by the central bank is loaned at interest. That means every single dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percent of debt based on that dollar. And since the central bank has the monopoly over the production of the currency for the entire country, and they loan each dollar out with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the central bank again, which means the central bank has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created, which in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, creates even more debt. The end result of this system without fail is slavery, for it is impossible for the government and thus the public to ever come out of the self-generating debt. The founding fathers of this country were well aware of this.
By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few central banking systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking and business world were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds. And in the early 1900s, they sought to push, once again, legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and public were very weary of such an institution, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. So, J.P. Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by publishing rumors that a prominent bank in New York was insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would cause mass hysteria, which would affect other banks as well. And it did. The public, in fear of losing their deposits, immediately began mass withdrawals. Consequently, the banks were forced to call in their loans, causing the recipients to sell their property, and thus a spiral of bankruptcies, repossessions, and turmoil emerged. Putting the pieces together a few years later, Frederick Allen of Life magazine wrote, The Morgan interests took advantage to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed. Unaware of the fraud, the Panic of 1907 led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who had intimate ties to the banking cartels and later became part of the Rockefeller family through marriage. The commission, led by Aldrich, recommended a central bank should be implemented so a panic like 1907 could never happen again. This was the spark the international bankers needed to initiate their plan. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended disguised their names when en route to the island. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. Later, Woodrow Wilson wrote, in regret, Congressman Lewis McFadden also expressed the truth after the passage of the bill. A world banking system was being set up here, a super state controlled by international bankers acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. The Fed has usurped the government. Now, the public was told that the Federal Reserve System was an economic stabilizer and inflation and economic crises were a thing of the past. Well. As history has shown, nothing is further from the truth. The fact is, the international bankers now had a streamlined machine to expand their personal ambitions. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! For example, from 1914 to 1919, the Fed increased the money supply by nearly 100%, resulting in extensive loans to small banks and the public. Then, in 1920, the Fed called in mass percentages of the outstanding money supply, thus resulting in the supporting banks having to call in huge numbers of loans, and, just like 1907, bank runs, bankruptcy, and collapse occurred. Over 5,400 competitive banks outside of the Federal Reserve System collapsed, further consolidating the monopoly of the small group of international bankers. Privy to this crime, Congressman Lindbergh stepped up and said in 1921, Under the Federal Reserve Act, Panics are scientifically created. The present panic is the first scientifically created one, worked out as we figure a mathematical equation. However, the panic of 1920 was just a warm-up. From 1921 to 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply, resulting once again in extensive loans to the public and banks. 
There was also a fairly new type of loan called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, the margin loan allowed an investor to put down only 10% of a stock's price, with the other 90% being loaned through the broker. In other words, a person could own $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This method was very popular in the roaring 1920s, as everyone seemed to be making money in the market. However, there was a catch to this loan. It could be called in at any time and had to be paid within 24 hours. This is termed a margin call, and the typical result of a margin call is the selling of the stock purchased with the loan. So, a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, Bernard Barak, and other insiders quietly exited the market. And on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in in mass. This sparked an instantaneous, massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It then triggered mass bank runs for the same reason, in turn collapsing over 16,000 banks, enabling the conspiring international bankers to not only buy up rival banks at a discount, but to also buy up whole corporations at pennies on the dollar. It was the greatest robbery in American history. But that didn't stop there. Rather than expanding the money supply in order to recover from this economic collapse, the Fed actually contracted it, fueling one of the largest depressions in history. Once again outraged, Congressman Lewis McFadden, a longtime opponent of the banking cartels, began bringing impeachment proceedings against the Federal Reserve Board, saying of the crash and depression, it was a carefully contrived occurrence. International bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge the rulers of us all. Not surprisingly, and after two previous assassination attempts, McFadden was poisoned at a banquet before he could push for the impeachment. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve bankers decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill from before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. You look at a dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives our money value is how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power to bring entire economies and societies to its knees. It's important to clearly understand, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is about as federal as Federal Express. It makes its own policies and is under virtually no regulation by the U.S. government. It is a private bank that loans all the currency at interest to the government, completely consistent with the fraudulent central banking model that the country sought to escape from when it declared independence in the American Revolutionary War. Now, going back to 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was not the only unconstitutional bill pushed through Congress. They also pushed the Federal Income Tax. It's worthwhile to point out that the American public's ignorance towards the Federal Income Tax is a testament to how dumbed down and oblivious the American population really is. First of all, the Federal Income Tax is completely unconstitutional, as it is a direct, unapportioned tax. All direct taxes have to be apportioned to be legal based on the Constitution. Secondly, the required number of states in order to ratify the amendment to allow the income tax was never met, and this has even been cited in modern court cases. Third, at the present day, roughly 25% of the average worker's income is taken via this tax. And guess where that money goes? It goes to pay the interest on the currency being produced by the fraudulent Federal Reserve Bank, a system that does not have to exist at all. The money you make working almost three months out of the year goes almost literally into the pockets of the international bankers who own the private Federal Reserve Bank. And fourth, even with the fraudulent government claim as to the legality of the income tax, there is literally no statute, no law in existence that requires you to pay this tax, period. I really expected that of course there's a law that you can point to in the law book, the code, that requires you to file a tax return. Of course there is. I was at that point where I couldn't find the statute that clearly made a person liable. 
uh, at least not me and uh, most people I know and I had no no choice in my mind except to to resign based on the research that I did throughout the year 2000 and that I'm still doing I have not found that law I've asked uh, Congress we've asked a lot of people in the IRS the IRS commissioners helpers they can't answer because if they answer the American people are gonna know that this whole thing is a fraud I haven't uh, filed an income federal income tax return since I left I have not filed a tax return since 1999 the income tax is nothing less than the enslavement of the entire country. Now, the control of the economy and the perpetual robbery of wealth is only one side of the Rubik's Cube the bankers hold in their hands. The next tool for profit and control is war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, a number of large and small wars have commenced. The three most pronounced were World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. World War I. In 1914, European wars broke out centered around England and Germany. The American public wanted nothing to do with the war. In turn, President Woodrow Wilson publicly declared neutrality. However, under the surface, the U.S. administration was looking for any excuse it could find to enter it. In a noted observation by Secretary of State William Jennings, the large banking interests were deeply interested in the World War because of the wide opportunities for large profits. It's important to understand that the most lucrative thing that can happen for the international bankers is war, for it forces the country to borrow even more money from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest. Woodrow Wilson's top advisor and mentor was Colonel Edward House, a man with intimate connections with the international bankers who wanted in the war. In a documented conversation between Colonel House, Wilson's advisor, and Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary of England, regarding how to get America into the war, Gray inquired, what will Americans do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House responded, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into war. So on May 7, 1915, on essentially the suggestion of Sir Edward Gray, a ship called the Lusitania was deliberately sent into German controlled waters where German military vessels were known to be. And, as expected, German U-boats torpedoed the ship, exploding stored ammunition, killing 1,200 people. To further understand the deliberate nature of this setup, the German embassy actually put advertisements in the New York Times telling people that if they boarded the Lusitania, they did so at their own risk, as such a ship sailing from America to England through the war zone would be liable to destruction. In turn, and as anticipated, the sinking of the Lusitania caused a wave of anger among the American population, and America entered the war a short time after. The First World War caused 323,000 American deaths. J.D. Rockefeller made $200 million off of it. Not to mention the war cost about $30 billion for America, most of which was borrowed from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest, furthering the profits of the international bankers. World War II. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, triggering our entry into that war. President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared the attack was a day that will live in infamy. A day of infamy indeed, but not because of the alleged surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. After 60 years of surfacing information, it is clear that not only was the attack on Pearl Harbor known weeks in advance, it was outright wanted and provoked. Roosevelt, whose family had been New York bankers since the 18th century, whose uncle Frederick was on the original Federal Reserve Board, was very sympathetic to the interests of the international bankers, and the interest was to enter the war, as as we've seen, nothing is more profitable for international bankers than war. In a journal entry by Roosevelt Sec Roosevelt's Secretary of War Henry Stimson, dated November 25, 1941, he documented a conversation he had with Roosevelt. The question was, how should we maneuver them into firing the first shot? It was desirable to make sure the Japanese be the ones to do this, so that there should remain no doubt as to who were the aggressors. In the months leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had done almost everything in his power to anger the Japanese, showing a posture of aggression. He halted all of Japan's imports of American petroleum. He froze all the Japanese assets in the United States. He made public loans to nationalist China and supplied military aid to the British, both enemies of Japan in the war, which, by the way, is completely in violation of international war rules. And on December 4th, three days before the attack, Australian intelligence told Roosevelt about a Japanese task force moving towards Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt ignored it. 
So, as hoped and allowed, on December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, killing 2,400 soldiers. Before Pearl Harbor, 83% of the American public wanted nothing to do with the war. After Pearl Harbor, one million men volunteered for the war. It is important to note, Nazi Germany's war effort was largely supported by two organizations, one of which was called IG Farben. IG Farben produced 84% of Germany's explosives and even the Zyklon B used in the concentration camps to kill millions. One of the unspoken partners of IG Farben was J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company in America. In fact, the German Air Force could not operate without a special additive patented by Rockefeller's Standard Oil. The drastic bombing of London by Nazi Germany, for example, was made possible by a $20 million sale of fuel to IG Farben by the Rockefeller Standard Oil Company. This is just one small point on the topic of how American business funded both sides of World War II. One other treasonous organization worth mentioning is the Union Banking Corporation of New York City. Not only did it finance numerous aspects of Hitler's rise to power, along with actual materials during the war, it was also a Nazi money laundering bank, which was eventually exposed for having millions of dollars of Nazi money in its vaults. The Union Banking Corporation of New York was eventually seized for violations of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Guess who the director and vice president of the Union Bank was? Prescott Bush, our current president's grandfather, and of course our former president's father. Keep that in mind when considering the moral and political dispositions of the Bush family. Vietnam The United States official declaration of war in North Vietnam in 1964 came after an alleged incident involving two U.S. destroyers being attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. This was known as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. This single situation was the catalytic pretext for massive troop deployment and full-fledged warfare. One problem, however, the attack on the U.S. destroyers by Vietnamese PT boats never happened. It was a completely staged event to have an excuse to enter the war. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara stated years later that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a mistake, while many other insiders and officers have come forward relaying that it was a contrived farce, a complete lie. Once in the war, it was business as usual. In October 1966, President Lyndon Johnson lifted trade restrictions on the Soviet bloc, knowing full well that the Soviets were providing upwards of 80% of North Vietnam's war supplies. Consequently, Rockefeller interests financed factories in the Soviet Union, which the Soviets used to manufacture military equipment and send it to North Vietnam. However, the funding of both sides of this conflict was only one side of the coin. In 1985, Vietnam's rules of engagement were declassified. This detailed what American troops were and were not allowed to do in the war. It included absurdities like North Vietnamese anti-aircraft missile systems could not be bombed until they were known to be fully operational. No enemy could be pursued once they crossed the border of Laos or Cambodia. And most revealing of all, the most critical strategic targets were not allowed to be attacked unless initiated by high military officials. Apart from these imposed ludicrous limitations, North Vietnam was informed of these restrictions and therefore could base entire strategies around the limitations of the American forces. This is why the war went on so long. And the bottom line is this, the Vietnam War was never meant to be won, just sustained. This war for profit resulted in 58,000 American deaths and 3 million dead Vietnamese. So, where are we now? September 11th was the jumpstart for what is now an accelerated agenda by the ruthless elite. It was a staged war pretext no different than the sinking of the Lusitania, the provoking of Pearl Harbor, and the Gulf of Tonkin lie. In fact, if 9-11 wasn't a planned war pretext, it would be an exception to the rule. It has been used to launch two unprovoked illegal wars, one against Iraq and one against Afghanistan. However, 9-11 was a pretext for another war as well, the war against you. The Patriot Act, Homeland Security, the Military Tribunals Act, and other legislations are all completely and entirely designed to destroy your civil liberties and limit your ability to fight back against what is coming. Currently in the United States, unannounced to most brainwashed Americans, your home can be searched without a warrant, without you being home, you can in turn be arrested with no charges revealed to you, detained indefinitely with no access to a lawyer, and legally tortured all under the suspicion that you might be a terrorist. 
If you need a painted picture of what is happening in this country, let's recognize how history repeats itself. In February 1933, Hitler staged a false flag attack, burning down his own German parliament building, the Reichstag, and blamed it on communist terrorists. In the next few weeks, he passed the Enabling Act, which completely eradicated the German constitution, destroying people's liberties. He then led a series of preemptive wars, all justified to the German people as necessary to maintaining homeland security. It's time to wake up. The people in power go out of their way to make sure that you are perpetually misled and manipulated. The majority's perception of reality, especially in the political arena, is not their own. It is shrewdly imposed upon them without them even knowing it. For example, the public at large actually believes the invasion of Iraq is going badly, as sectarian violence doesn't seem to stop. What the public fails to see is that the destabilization of Iraq is exactly what the people behind the government want. This war is to be sustained so the region can be divided up, domination of the oil maintained, continual profits reaped for the defense contractors, and most importantly, permanent military bases established to be used as a launching pad against other oil-bearing, non-conforming countries such as Iran and Syria. For further implication that the civil war and destabilization is purely intentional, in 2005, two elite British SAS officers were arrested by Iraqi police after being caught driving around in their car shooting at civilians while dressed up as Arabs. After being arrested and taken to a jail in Basra, the British Army immediately requested the release of these men. When the Basra government refused, British tanks came in and physically broke out the men from the Basra prison. If you wish to destroy an area, how do you do it? Well, there are two ways. You can go in there and bomb it and so forth, but that is not very efficient. What you do is you try to get the people in that area to kill each other and to destroy their own territory, their own farms. And that's what's been done in that area. The way in which you destroy an opponent is get him to destroy himself by dividing his ranks against one another. Then you feed both sides. You have agents feeding both sides, inflaming both sides. And they kill each other off. And it's time that some of us woke up to this reality to understand that people who try to maintain empires and create empires do it by manipulating the people they're trying to conquer. You might want to ask yourself why the entire culture is utterly saturated with mass media entertainment from all sides. While the educational system in America continues its stupefying downward slide since the U.S. government decided to take over and subsidize the public school system. What your government pays for, it gets. When we understand that, then we look at government financed institutions of education and see the kind of students and the kind of education that's being turned out by these government finance schools, logic will tell you that if what is being turned out in those schools was not in accord with what the state and the federal government wanted, then it would change it. The bottom line is that the government is getting what they have ordered. They do not want your children to be educated. They do not want you to think too much. That is why our country and our world has become so proliferated with entertainments, mass media, television shows, amusement parks, drugs, alcohol, and every kind of entertainment to keep the human mind entertained so that you don't get in the way of important people by doing too much thinking 
you had better wake up and understand that there are people who are guiding your life and you don't even know it. We're in a lot of trouble because you people and 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it all falls in the hands of the wrong people. And when the largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network. So you listen to me. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You eat like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. The last thing the men behind the curtain want is a conscious, informed public capable of critical thinking, which is why a continually fraudulent zeitgeist is output via religion, the mass media, and the educational system. They seek to keep you in a distracted, naive bubble, and they are doing a damn good job of it. In 2005, an arrangement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States was made. This arrangement, unannounced to the public, unregulated by Congress, merges the United States, Mexico, and Canada into one entity, erasing all borders. It's called the North American Union, and you might want to ask yourself why you've never heard of this. In fact, there is only one mainstream reporter who has actually heard of and has had the courage to cover this issue. The Bush administration's open borders policy and its uh, decision to ignore the enforcement of this country's immigration laws is part of a broader agenda. President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it. And he took the step without approval from either the U.S. Congress or the people of the United States. It's a deal that few have even heard of. It's being done again by very few people at the very top on behalf of the investment class. But the working class of people, uh, political officials across our country from communities, uh, from cities and so forth, they don't know anything about this. This isn't some trade agreement. It is a total removal of sovereignty from these countries, which will also result in a completely new currency called the Amero. Fall. Um, apart from that, I think one thing people who are dollar-based need to focus on is the Amero. That's the one thing that nobody's talking about that I think is going to have a big impact on, uh, on everybody's life in Canada, the U.S., and uh, Mexico. The Amero is the proposed new currency for the North American community, which is being uh, developed right now between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico to make a borderless community much like the EU, and uh, the dollar, Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso replaced by the by default of this agreement, the American Constitution will eventually be obsolete. You would think that a situation like this would be on the cover of every major newspaper. That is until you realize that the people who are behind this movement are the same people behind the mainstream media, and you are not told what you're not supposed to know. The North American Union is the same concept as the European Union, the African Union, and the soon-to-be Asian Union, and the same people are behind all of them. And when the time is right, the North American Union, the European Union, the African Union, and the Asian Union will be merged together, forming the final stages of a plan these men have been working on for over 60 years. A one world government.
One bank, one army, one center of power. And if we have learned anything from history, it is that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is Aaron Russo, a filmmaker and former politician. To his left is Nicholas Rockefeller of the infamous Rockefeller banking and business dynasty. After maintaining a close friendship with Nicholas Rockefeller, Aaron eventually ended the relationship, appalled by what he had learned about the Rockefellers and their ambitions. Uh, I got a call one day from um, an attorney woman I knew, and she said, would you like to meet one of the Rockefellers? I said, sure, I'd love to. And uh, we became friends, and um, he began to divulge a lot of things to me. So he said to me one night, he said that uh, there's going to be an event there, and and out of that event, you're going to see we're going to go into Afghanistan. So we run pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We're going to go into Iraq to take the oil and establish a base in the Middle East. And we're going to go into Venezuela and, and try and get, and get rid of Chavez. And uh, the first two they've accomplished, Chavez they didn't accomplish. And uh, I said, you're going to see guys going into caves looking for, <laughs> looking for people uh, that they're never going to find. You know, he was laughing about the fact that you have this war on terror there's no real enemy he's talking about how by having this war on terror you can never win it because this is, so it's an eternal war and so you can always keep taking people's liberties away and i said how are you going to convince people that this war is real he said but the media the media can convince everybody it's real i mean you know it's just that you keep talking about things you keep saying it over and over and over again and eventually people believe it you know you created the Federal reserve in 1913 through lies you create 9-11, which is another lie. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror, and now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which was another lie, and now they're going to do Iran. You know, and it's all one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. Now, I would say, to them, Why, what are you doing this for? What, what, what's the point of this thing? You have all the money in the world you ever want. You have all the power. I said, you know, you're hurting people. It's, it's not a good thing. And he would say, what do you care about the people for? Take care of yourself and you take care of your family. And then I said to him, What's the ultimate, what are the ultimate goals here? He said, the ultimate, the, goal, the ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with the, with the RFID chip and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off that chip. That's right, microchipped. In 2005, Congress, under the pretense of immigration control and the so-called War on Terrorism, passed the Real ID Act, under which it is projected by May 2008, you will be required to carry around a federal identification card, which includes on it a scannable barcode with your personal information. However, this barcode is only an intermediary step before the card is equipped with a Verichip RFID tracking module which will use radio frequencies to track your every move on the planet. If this sounds foreign to you, please note that the RFID tracking chip is already in all new American passports. And the final step is the implanted chip, which many people have already been manipulated into accepting under different pretenses. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. In the end, everybody will be locked into a monitored control grid where every single action you perform is documented. And if you get out of line, they can just turn off your chip, for at that point in time, every single aspect of society will revolve around interactions with the chips. This is the picture that is painted for the future if you open your eyes to see it. A centralized one world economy where everyone's moves and everyone's transactions are tracked and monitored, all rights removed. The most incredible aspect of all. These totalitarian elements will not be forced upon the people the people will demand them. For the social manipulation of society through the generation of fear and division has completely detached humans from their sense of power and reality. A process which has been going on for centuries if not millennia. Religion, patriotism, race, wealth, class, and every other form of arbitrary separatist identification and thus conceit has served to create a controlled population utterly malleable in the hands of the few 
divide and conquer is the motto and as long as people continue to see themselves as separate from everything else they lend themselves to being completely enslaved the men behind the curtain know this and they also know that if people ever realize the truth of their relationship to nature and the truth of their personal power the entire manufactured zeitgeist they prey upon will collapse like a house of cards the whole system that we live in drills into us that we're powerless, that we're weak, that our society is evil, that it's private, and etc. and so forth. It's all a big fat lie. We are powerful, beautiful, extraordinary. There is no reason why we cannot understand who we truly are, where we are going. There is no reason why the average individual cannot be fully empowered. We are incredibly powerful beings. Now, I think I spent 30 years of my life in the first 30, trying to become something. I want to become good at things. I want to become good at tennis. I want to become good at school and grades and, and everything I kind of viewed in that perspective. I'm not okay the way I am, but if I got good at things, I realized that I had the game wrong. The game was to find out what I already was. Find out what I already was. we've been trained for individual differences to stand out. So you look at each person, immediately it is brighter, dumber, older, younger, richer, poorer, and we make all these dimensional dis distinctions, put them in categories and treat them that way. And we get so that we only see others as separate from ourselves in the ways in which they're separate. And one of the dramatic characteristics of experience is being with another person and suddenly seeing the ways in which they are like you, not different from you. And experiencing the fact that, that which is essence in you and which is essence in me is indeed one. The understanding that there is no other. It is all one. And I wasn't born Richard Albert, I was just born as a human being. And then I learned this whole business of who I am and whether I'm good or bad or achieving or not, all that's learned along the way. The old appeals to racial, sexual, religious chauvinism, to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. with this. Life's like a ride in an amusement park. And when you go on it, you think it's real, because that's how powerful our minds are. And the ride goes up and down and round and round. It has thrills and chills, and it's very brightly colored. And it's very loud, and it's fun for a while. Some have been on the ride for a long time, and they begin to question, is this real, or is this just a ride? And other people have remembered, and they come back to us, and they say, Hey, don't worry, don't be afraid ever, because this is just a ride. And we kill those people. Shut him up, I've got a lot invested in this ride. Shut him up! Look at my furrows of worry. Look at my big bank account, my family. This has to be real. It's just a ride. 
But we're gonna kill those good guys and try and tell us that. You ever notice that? And let the demons run amok? But it doesn't matter, because it's just a ride, and we can change it in time we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings with money. Just a choice right now between fear and love.